I would uh, open the floor for questions. I already see Simon uh, Hicks uh, who would like to add something or ask a question, please. Thanks very much. I'll wait for the camera to come around to me. Um, <laughs> I thought I'd jump in now because I'm afraid I've, I've got to leave in a few minutes. Um, but I wanted to come back to something that all three of the speakers that came after me raised, which is about the costs um, and you know how we pay for this. Uh, and the comment I made about there being enough money in the system. The real problem is a coordination problem because there's enough money in the system, but it's it's allocated in different places and not everybody has access to all of it, right? So on the one side, there's the publishers and I really feel for not-for-profit publishers like uh, OUP and CUP who are being asked to do more and more in terms of dissemination, open access, transforming the way they, they you know, it, the, the costs will go up for some of these very ambitious open access uh, goals that we've got or open science goals that include dissemination of data and so on. Um, and of course, all the social media expenses that the, the publishers are now taking on to promote research. Um, then you've got the libraries, I think. Libraries are you know, very squeezed because they're being asked to pay for, for, for not just subscription, but pay to, not just pay to, to, to read, but also pay to read and publish, uh, as, as uh, Demi put it. And I know from, from LSE, when I was at LSE, this was a, you know, our acquisitions budget, our acquisitions costs were going through the roof uh, because of this. And on the other side, we have, of course, the research budgets or research accounts. And, and there's very little joined up thinking across, in my experience, between the research budgets and the library budgets. And we need to think much more holistically about how we link up resources, the public resources and private resources that come into research funding and how we ring fence big chunks of that over to dissemination and open access to give libraries access to this so they can actually get those resources to journals and when journals need them. Um, and so, you know, I'd like, we need a holistic conversation around costs that go all the way to how we price in, for example, grants to Horizon Europe or grants to ERC or grants to other funding agents, um, the, where actually big chunks of that, it's much more natural in the, in the natural sciences, but not in the social sciences, I think, for us to factor in the costs of full proper open science in our research uh, and acknowledging that it, this, there we are costs and these costs need to travel from the funder to the university, to the library, to the publisher. And I don't think yet we've figured out good ways to do that. So I'll put that on the table now and I'll stay for another few minutes to listen to comments, but then I'm afraid I've, I've got to leave. Thanks very much. Oh, if uh, Simon, if you are about to leave, uh, we are recording. So if you just, uh, it's okay with you that we share these thoughts uh, somehow. Okay, thank you. Um, as well as for the presentation, since I'm saying this, uh, we will be able to share them later on in a blog post or, or something like that, okay? Um, so I, I, I know Pep has another question, Simone also. Um, I was wondering a little bit who would like to comment on Simon's uh, uh, comments first. Uh, in addition to that, perhaps also say something on the transparency of these costs, um, which is very complex today to, to understand. There are so many models. Uh, I would maybe invite both uh, Demi and, and Andy to comment on that, uh, unless there is some additional linked question to this. Uh, yes, Simone would like to add something first, and then maybe we can go over to Demi and uh, Andy mostly, but also Eva, of course. Thanks. Yeah, I think my, my question uh, uh, links really back to the idea of, you know, there's enough money in the system, and there's actually most likely a lot more money than it's needed in the system because uh, of the issue of uh, transparency. Now, I know that, you know, there are uh, publishers and publishers, so I'm not going to comment on anyone, uh, but there's a clear uh, issue when you see that, for example, for a journal, an APC is, uh, I don't know, 5,000 euros, and for another journal, supposedly of decent quality, uh, we are talking about 900. 
So there's a clear discrepancy between the costs of individual publication, and I'm not commenting on or giving any answer there. I'm just asking, why is that? Why the range is so wide? And uh, what is the added value of the ones that cost 5,000 and not 900? Uh, so this, it's, it's again about costs uh, and the money in the system, which unluckily for us, or at least for the research community is really not transparent. Who would like to uh, make some comments on this? Uh, Eva Mendes, please. Um, I would like to chime in because I think the, the putting on the table the, the topic of the cost is the most interesting thing because at the end, the most sensitive part of a human being is the pocket. And the institutions, we have pockets. And the funders, they have pockets. And what we know is that it's not an infinite top. Uh, in, in, it's not infinite, the, the amount of money that you have in your pocket. And the point is that sometimes when, when you mentioned at the beginning uh, that the research budget should go to the library budget, um, sometimes how to pass the money from the founder to the library to the institution, I want to have two comments. One is that um, sometimes the, it's mostly impossible how much money do we spend in APCs? We were trying to make a calculation and the Spanish universities, because sometimes the, the author pays from his own pocket. This is crucial that sometimes they need to do it because they need a publication and they, they pay their own APC. And sometimes uh, there is a project that there is not eligible cost and sometimes it's eligible. It's impossible to calculate how much we are spending APCs, probably much more than we thought. And also the point is that sometimes when you say, well, uh, if it is eligible, the APC cost, that's fine. But excuse me, an ERC grantee will be happier than paying 5,000 euros for uh, which extra value of the publication. I'm here with, with Simone. What is, the, what is the point of paying 5,000 euros on top of the, what you have already done, the, the, the English, English peer review, you have done uh, the perfect layout for the publication. What do they do on top of that? They give it to a monk and they just put it in a stone what would they do for making to charge you 5,000 euros? But also if you are an ESC grantee, you prefer to spend these 5,000 euros in contracting a new researcher, an early career researcher, a PhD student to involve them in your research. It's not about that if it is paid by the budget of the research, it's fine with the researcher. If it is paid by the library, I heard that the library pays my APCs, they ask a researcher for me. And I say, no, it's not the library, it's the taxpayers of this country that pays for that. That's the point. So just to, to, to contribute to the debate. Thank you. Uh, uh, Demi, please go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to pick up on sort of the initial question. I, I fully agree that probably we need to rethink then like a uh, is a research budget and a library budget, or these two not separated? At the same time, I definitely also think that this is a, a point in time that librarians need to take their responsibility. I have colleagues and very trusted colleagues or very appreciated colleagues who say like, yeah, but the, the, all the money that goes into open access, let's separate that from the library. We do subscriptions sort of, and, and like, yeah, and I don't have the budget to also do open access. I think that is a horrible, ID, because first of all, like, uh, what is then our future still? Like, uh, is are we only going to do subscriptions and open access is not the business of the library? But also, we are the ones who, with the experience, it's not the job of the, the individual researchers to know this. They, 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 of course, they pay 5,000 euros for a prestige journal because they don't know any better. We're the ones there to say, like, uh, be careful what you're doing. Uh, publishers are not, I do not think that publishers are the enemy. It's a spectrum. You have people on the very, publishers on the very left that are really pure for profit. Then you have publishers on the right hand side of the spectrum who actually work at a loss uh, for the sake of scholarship. Um, and you have all sorts, every publisher is somewhere on that spectrum. 
And it's just our job to also say to researchers to try to help the researcher to estimate, okay, which publisher suits your needs best? Like, and know what the trade-off is here. Even with publishers on the left-hand side of the spectrum, they might be doing a very good job, but it's going to be very costly. And you need to remember as a researcher, you're not going to be the one in charge. You're not even going to be the customer. You're going to be the product that is being sold. If you're okay with that, you can live with that. But it's our job to explain that to the researcher, I think. Uh, and, and so I do, and, and that's why I think we, I, I, and I will, of course, in, in some fields, it's seen that, of course, you want more money for the library. But I do think we should put the open access budget with the library and not with an individual researcher or with the researcher coordinations. Thank you, uh, Demi. That's very clear and interesting for ongoing discussions and the conversation that we are actually having right now as well at this institution. Um, um, any other questions? I think Pep had a question before. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Lotta. Well, it, uh, it was first more a question and um, of course for everybody, but more for Demi, but I think that it turned now into a um, a comment more than than a question. You, Demi, said that um, you invited libraries to invest budget in um, collaborative funded um, initiatives in open access, and I do agree that we should be doing this. But it, the last, not not the last fifteen years, as um, because we were discussing open access and we said this fifteen years, but uh, in the last thirty years, libraries have been invited or forced, or I don't know how to say it, to share budgets in uh, consortiums to buy uh, and license content. So if we are now in a moment that we need to consider investing money uh, in new open access initiatives, there is very few money left. So our budget, uh, we, we can build something, we can, we can build something new but we need to deconstruct what we built before because otherwise I was having precisely a, an internal conversation with uh, Lotta here about in, in how to invest uh, a very small portion of the budget that we still have in open access initiatives, but uh, most of our budget goes to the traditional publisher. So it's not a matter of building something new. We need to deconstruct in order to be able to build something new. Um, otherwise, it is it is impossible for for the libraries to. I mean, we do not have two different budgets: the budget for open access and the budget for commercial publishers. So it's it's like a kind of a trap in this very moment. And I know that many publishers are are willing to help and understand the situation, especially those that came from the academic publishing from the very beginning. But it's not the case of many others. I I completely agree, and that is my main worry, mostly with transformative agreements for the time being, is that if we only do them at four or five, in a, in a particular read and publish deals with four or five of the big ones, we're actually making it even worse and making sure that there's definitely not enough money left for anything else. So the, what we need to do is, is like, uh, and, and that's what we actually, the, the reality in Leuven that we're now doing is we just make sure that we safeguard part of the budget to put in non-profit stuff. Um, and it comes at the expense of putting it into with commercial publishers. And it's just a decision we made, like uh, I will make that decision for the Arts and Humanities Library. If I need to decide between putting money to, to Cambridge or to Cogitatio, I will say I can go to Cambridge to that level, but I will always make sure that I keep money enough to Cogitatio as well. And if that means that I need to like invest less with Cambridge, then so be it. Uh, but can never be that I have to invest so much with Cambridge that I can no longer afford COVID-19. Uh, and those are tough decisions to make. Thank you, Demi. I see uh, Andy, you have your hand raised, so please give your input on this. Hi. Uh, um, I um, was going to, uh, again, to, to Simone's question about um, the enough money in the system. Um, uh, just to, to join the dots really from uh, the point that Simon was making about a holistic approach being required and also the point that, um, that Ava was making about um, that kind of triangle of requirements between changes to culture and reward 
changes to research assessment as well as the introduction of open research methods and 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 that that really also speaks to the to the need for something which is more holistic because um there whilst there is enough money in the system uh, it is also the case that currently research outputs are still increasing on an annual basis um, and part of the problem that um, uh, one of the intractable problems is that uh, the current system uh, the funding isn't there to carry on supporting the publication of outputs in in the same way that, that has traditionally been the case. So um, there is there are other questions that need to be asked, not least in relation to uh, to the culture to to academic culture and and the process of reward and recognition. Um, something needs to happen so that there are better ways of of actually assessing and recognizing um, uh, high quality work and high quality research other than through publication outputs. And um, when we see things like the Citations Index, the Citations Index was invented, I don't know, it was potentially 50 years ago, uh, um, but it was invented and at, at the time it seemed like quite a good way of, of providing information for people. Um, and we need to move on from, from those sorts of techniques. But there is a challenge, there's, there's a question here for the Academy. Because if I look at the the situation in the UK, uh, we have um, we have a, a, a thing called REF, which is the Research um, uh, uh, Excellence um, Process, which is um, just completing um, uh, its most recent round. And during that process, everything which is submitted to the REF is is assessed for quality by a, by a panel of peers and experts. And yet, um, none uh, the the information will be released at an institutional level, but not at the granular level in terms of the, the of the outputs themselves. And that's be partly because it would be problematic um, to release critiques of um, uh, uh, authoritative critiques or um, governmental critiques of, of individual researchers' work. So th there's a question there's a question here and a challenge for the academy as well about what is an appropriate process for assessment. Um, uh, I recognise and I think everyone recognises that publishers have become a proxy for, for research assessment and research quality. Um, but uh, but in order to, to step away from publishers acting in that capacity, and I think it is something that needs to happen, uh, there needs to be an alternative and there needs to be a, a, a way that that can happen in an objective way, um, but, but, in a, but in a way which picks up on one of the other points that I would just like to draw um, a dot a connection back to, which was a point that Simon mentioned right at the outset about um, uh, the ability to correct mistakes, the, un the the acceptance and a cultural acceptance that not everything is going to be perfect, but that people need to be able to step in, um, uh, point out mistakes, correct mistakes in a simple and effective way, um, and to accept that that's part and parcel of the overall research landscape. Um, uh, so there are there are a number of, of issues in there, um, many of which are locked into to the points that Ava touched on in in the final in the final presentation uh, about that triangle of of culture, reward, assessment, and open research. Thank you very much. Um, anyone else who have questions? Um, also, attendees, yeah? From Serge to everyone, yes. Let me see. I'll read it. So to Andy, am I wrong or, well, you can all read it, I think, because to everyone. Am I wrong or it seems that the growing open access approach at Oxford University Press is mainly dealing with STEM contents? Actually, I wanted to ask that too, especially for the flipping of open access journals. Why is it so if it is the case and what about social sciences uh, and humanities? Are there any differences here, maybe connected to the financial investments by stakeholders, libraries, universities, public money? Social sciences and humanities are the core business here at DUI, of course, yes, okay. Please, Andy, if you want to uh, comment on that, if there are any future plans also on the flipping of uh, open access to open uh, flipping journals, I think you mentioned that there were only uh, STEM journals, yeah? The, um, uh, thanks, Lotter, and, and thank you for the question. Um, uh, 
um, I have a blog piece coming out later this week um, on our website for Open Access Week, which um, uh, looks specifically at um, um, what um, we're now calling SHAPE, the, the non-STEM disciplines and open access. Um, and one of the points that I would make in, in relation to that is that um, I think that, that there is an extent to which um, researchers in, in um, the arts, humanities and social sciences felt that open access was something which was being imposed on them by STEM researchers rather than something which was organically part of a uh, part and practice uh, of the way that they worked. Um, and uh, and, I, and I, I wonder whether actually the broader conversation now about open research might actually be the route by which um, uh, more openness openness takes place in um, in the social sciences, the arts and humanities. That some of the the methods, the systems, the supportive environments, um, and uh, and the communications that go with it may actually mean that that the journey itself to open becomes easier for uh, for researchers in the humanities and social sciences. Nevertheless, I think um, it is the case that um, uh, when we're looking at, um, at funding for open access, um, a higher proportion of, of direct grant funding, which is usually the, the source by which open can be achieved, um, is associated with, with STEM uh, grant funding than for um, the arts, humanities and social sciences. So I think that um, to date has been a reason why open has been less uh, accessible as, as, a, as a, um, a route for, uh, for people in the social sciences. I do think, um, and in terms of the, uh, the good, the bad and the beautiful, um, I do think that one of the good things that um, uh, that Read and Publish does is um, it creates a uh, an, a relationship in the round between a consortium and an, or an institution and a publisher, which does mean that that um, that all disciplines have have equal access to open access outputs. So I think that I, um, I can't remember whether that was one of the things that um, uh, the demo had covered, but um, but certainly I think in terms of ensuring that everybody is able to make that journey to open, uh, I think that that is one of the potential benefits of read and publish deals as well. Thank you uh, for that, Andy. Uh, Simone, you would like to add something, yes? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so uh, I had a question. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a question for uh, anybody on the panel who would like to pick it up. It kind of goes back to the uh, part of the presentation or talk uh, from Simon Hicks. Uh, it's about the relationship between uh, reproducible research, the publishing side, sort of at the end of the spectrum, and uh, a sort of culture change that it's slightly happening uh, in the process. And I guess my, I would like to hear from, uh, from you all, uh, what your, what's your perspective in, in that relationship? If, uh, uh, you know, when, if we take the perspective that Simon presented that, you know, you uh, pre-register your work, you prepare a data management plan that highlights uh, uh, all the options for sharing with the, you know, all the uh, necessary information to make it everything reusable. Then you share your code, then you share reproducible papers ahead of time. Uh, how it's gonna play out at the end? Uh, I guess this, this, this last part is maybe for Andy <laughs> to answer. When, uh, what's the perspective from the publisher in that sense when everything is, has been open up until the end? In that way, uh, but for the others, in terms of uh, you know, if that is going to affect the business models uh, or the general practice in academia. Thank you, Simone, and Actually, over to Andy, and then uh, Demi again. And we still have five minutes, so uh, I'm sure it will be feasible. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, it's, an, it's an interesting question, right? and I think there is a genuine challenge in there for publishers. Um, I, was, I was thinking, and to, there is, a, there is a, 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 um, a, a potential issue in that publishing um, 
is 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 very visible in in this whole conversation and yet really if you if you strip it back um what publishers do is, is offer a service to research institutions in the same way that that many other suppliers offer services to research institutions and to researchers um and when we're talking about um about value add i think ultimately um uh, it will become a question of uh, are there cheaper better more effective ways of delivering some of these um some of these outputs uh, than going through traditional publishing systems um and and set against that um are publishers able to um work in partnership with the academy and with researchers and institutions um, to find ways where it makes most sense for publishers to offer that value and those services rather than for institutions, um, societies, associations, uh, whomever to do it themselves. Um, and, and that's going to be that's going to be an ongoing um, uh, conversation. I think um, uh, I've seen in the last couple of years um, uh, comments to the extent that um, uh, publishing commercial publishers like Elsevier are trying to transform their position in the market and move away from simply providing journal articles into providing um, data and analytics to um, to institutions. Um, and uh, and that, that there is some kind of um, uh, um, threat attached to that. Um, and there is, but only to the extent that um, that um, uh, an institution partnering with Microsoft or with Amazon Web Services for for other services that support research um, also involve threats in terms of lock in, in terms of of whether it's a, whether there are options. Uh, I think publishers uniquely have been um, uh, caught up in the idea that that researchers don't have a choice, that um, that there isn't really um, as much competition or choice available to people because people have felt the need to publish in a particular journal um, in a particular discipline and that that's been part of the lock-in. Um, certainly, um, um, and just to, to kind of um, come back to Simone's question, I think um, what open research will do is allow um, all of those connective pieces, the end-to-end -end pieces, to be more visible, more discoverable and more open. Um, it may well be that there are different architectures and overlays that come along um, to, to assist with, um, uh, with assessing that research, um, with signposting that research, curating it. Um, and, and certainly some of the things that Ava touched on in terms of metadata and thinking not just about traditional pages and, and traditional metaphors associated with print, but thinking about digital artifacts um, and how you catalogue them, um, how, you, um, how you add metadata in standard ways. Um, those sorts of things um, will give institutions and the research community more choice and help them be less dependent on publishers. And that may change the overall conversation about value at that point. Um, uh, the, the the fear in relation to read and publish agreements that um, what is happening is is that um, institutions are simply moving from one um, damaged relationship into another locked in damaged relationship. Um, I think is partly offset by some of the notions about open science and open research practices um, that were talked about by other speakers. Thanks. Uh, very quickly over to Demi, and uh, then I take the occasion also to thank you all for the moment. Okay. Yeah, the question of Simone and actually some of what Eva said reminded me of an article, I think only about a month ago, published by Bjorn Brems and others, and not as journal article, but actually on Zenodo. Hello. And he talks about replacing academic journals. He basically says, like, yeah, this doesn't work anymore. We have a trust issue. We put way too much trust in the peer review process and because it is published in a certain journal that we trusted, we have an affordability issue and we have a functionality issue. In reality, we don't use academic journals anymore for scholarly communication. We only use it for appointments and promotions, but that's a very expensive system to have if this is the only reason why we still have journals. So he actually argues, and I find it very difficult to disagree with him, why are we still doing this? We just need a digital uh, system, ecosystem, where we have interoperable standards to do this. Um, uh, and there might be a place for publishing this, but no longer as owners of anything. 
uh, service providers. Um, and I have to say, like, uh, I, on the one hand, it's an idealist. I, I don't know how we get there, but uh, I, the more I think about it, the more I find it hard to disagree. But the more, of course, I also have an identity crisis as a librarian to say, okay, let's stop doing academic journals. Like, okay, what will I do then instead? <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you. Very um, interesting. I'm trying also to read here and uh, yes. No, no, it's yeah, uh, that's the article shared in the chat, which, which we will be able to put also together in, uh, in, uh, in a summarized uh, version to all attendees together with the presentations, the uh, exactly. Um, the title of the, yeah, we will send it then. So thank you very much on behalf of uh, all of us from the uh, Library Open Science team and uh, also, yeah, well, also from the library director, of course. <laughs> and uh, yes, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. More information about library services can be found on our website and don't forget to follow our blog and social media channels to stay up to date with the latest news.